Good morning and good afternoon. Human dignity represents the inherent and equal worth of every person everywhere. Democracy is how we express our dignity. It's how we claim our rights to human flourishing and to live in a society of our own making. Dignity and democracy are intimately related and they need each other to survive. In the United States, dignity matters as well. The United States Supreme Court has recognized that democracy rests on the premise of individual dignity and choice. While voting itself does as well. For example, the South African Constitutional Court has found that voting is a badge of dignity and of personhood. And quite literally, it says that everybody counts. So welcome to this program on dignity and democracy. You're in for a treat. My name is Jim May, and I'm a professor and co-founder of the Dignity Rights Project at Delaware Law School and co-founder and president of Dignity Rights International and a co-founder of the Dignity Rights Initiative of the American Bar Association Center for Human Rights. We're th thrilled to be presenting a timely panel um, about how dignity and democracy are interrelated. It's sponsored by the American Bar Association Section on Civil Rights and Social Justice and the Center for Human Rights and co-sponsored by the Dignity Rights Project at Delaware Law School. We envision a conversation about dignity and democracy with topics including voter suppression, racial electoral inequities, gerrymandering, and other impediments to the full expression of participatory dignity. This panel is one of many in a series of rapid response webinars from the American Bar Association. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please visit the ABA website that you had in registering for this program for updates. Associated materials for this program are also available, including from Aaron Daly and from me and from Michael Tigar, and are available on the website for the program. Before we go to the program and how we'll work things today, I'd like to introduce Patricia Lee Rifo, the president of the American Bar Association for a few remarks. Trish. Thank you so much. It's really my pleasure to welcome all of you today to today's terrific program, a conversation on dignity, rights, and democracy, uh, jointly sponsored by the Section for Civil Rights and Social Justice, the Center for Human Rights, and a number of other co-sponsors whom you just heard. Uh, and in featuring some of the most amazing voices on these topics and a couple of my favorite people uh, in the world, which is why I'm delighted particularly to be part of this. Uh, I know that I don't need to say this to the group uh, on this call, but be sure you vote. Be sure everyone you know votes. Um, volunteer to be a poll worker as part of our poll worker ESQ project if you have the ability and the time yet to do that. Nothing's more important than making sure this election is free, fair, and open. Thank you all for joining us in this wonderful discussion and I look forward to seeing you at another ABA program very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Trish. So during today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A, not through the chat functions. So if you don't see the controls, please ensure your screen is not idle and we'll address questions at the end of the panel. We'll also be sharing a recording of the program to everyone who's registered so that they can share it widely within their networks. So let's turn to the program, shall we? And in the interest of time, let me refer you to the full biographies that are in the online program. But our first speaker for today is Professor Aaron Daly. Aaron is a professor of law at Delaware Law School, the executive director of Dignity Rights International, the co-founder of the Dignity Rights Project, and the author of the pioneering work, Dignity Rights, Courts, Constitutions, and the Equal Worth of the Human Person, which was just published in its second edition last Thursday. Erin? Thank you so much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here um, and to be part of this important conversation about two of the most important things that we could be talking about, human dignity and democracy. 
So let me just start by giving you a brief overview of some of the themes that we'll be talking about. Um, each of us is going to speak for about five minutes and then we'll have more opportunities for, for uh, discussion. Um, dignity reflects the human experience. It's how we feel about ourselves. It's what humanity thinks is important about humanity. If you scan the global case law in domestic courts and at the international level, it comes down to four simple things. Every person has inherent equal worth. So let me break that down for a second. It's universal, every person everywhere in present, past and future generations. Our worth is inherent. That means it's within us. It's not dependent on any legislative authority or any executive action. Every person has equal dignity, no acts of discrimination, oppression, degradation, humiliation are permissible in a society that values human dignity, whether it's a slap on the face or a knee on the neck. And last, importantly, it um, encompasses the idea of worth, that no life is dispensable. Everybody should have some agency over their own lives and should be able to live with dignity in society with others. Now the rights that flow from the recognition of dignity touch the breadth and depth of the human experience. Because as the United Nations has said since its foundation, the recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. In the ABA's wor words, According to the resolution passed last August, spearheaded by uh, Judge Donald on our panel in the Center for Human Rights, dignity rights are the foundation of a just rule of law. Or in the words of the International Covenants on Civil and Political Rights and Social and Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the, all rights derive from the inherent dignity of the human person. That's a lot of work for dignity to do. Throughout the 20th century, and especially in the 70 years since the end of World War II, dignity and rights have been linked because every member of the human family, according to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, is born equal in dignity and rights. By now, more than 160 constitutions recognize human dignity as a fundamental value, as an actionable right, or sometimes both, and sometimes even more things. In addition to those, Courts have implied dignity in constitutions where the text doesn't explicitly discuss it. This has happened or, or create a right to it. This has happened in India, it's happened in Canada in some ways, and it's happened in the United States. So the cases around the world about dignity touch on all parts of the human experience. They talk about how every person has the right to agency, to their own identity, to the full development of their personality. They talk about the quality of life, a life, um, the right to life is the right to live a life with dignity, to permit people to engage in society and to participate in um, social um, activity and in democratic decision-making. They talk about protection against humiliation and non-discrimination rights. And they talk about the right to have and to claim rights, to paraphrase Hannah Arendt. Dignity is important in law because it brings law closer to justice by connecting what's most important to people to the law itself. And it unifies rights because people experience their rights individually. If they can't eat, they can't learn. If people aren't healthy, it impairs their rights to live in, their ability to live in community with others. If they can't get to a polling place, they can't vote and express themselves politically and democratically. We see this in countless cases from around the world. In Germany, the Constitutional Court has said that the right to free and equal participation in public authority is enshrined in human dignity. In many other cases from the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and Europe, we see countless examples where courts have recognized the importance of what the South African court has called civic dignity and what we've called participatory dignity. As Professor May mentioned in his introductory remarks, the South African court has been especially um, uh, um, explicit 
and articulate in its uh, description of the relationship between dignity and democracy. It is said in one case that the right to speak and to be listened to is part of the right of a citizen in the full sense of that word. In a constitutional democracy, dialogue and the right to have a voice on public affairs is constitutive of dignity. It said that participation in public affairs is necessary to preserve dignity and self-respect. In an important case from South Africa called August and another from which Professor May quoted a moment ago, I want to just read to you the full passage because this is really important. This was a case about um, the ability of people who are incarcerated to vote even while they are incarcerated. And the court said that the universality of the franchise is important not only for nationhood and democracy, the vote of each, of each and every citizen is a badge of dignity and of personhood. In a country of great disparities of wealth and power, it declares that whoever we are, whether rich or poor, exalted or disgraced, we all belong to the same democratic country. That our destinies are intertwined in a single interactive polity. Rights may not be limited without justification and legislation dealing with the franchise must be interpreted in favor of enfranchisement rather than disenfranchisement. So we see in a lot of countries a very, very strong commitment both to the protection of human dignity in all of its fullness and to the importance of democratic participation and importantly to the connection between the two. We're going to be talking today about both of those issues and also about the role of the courts, the roles of lawyers in the um, bringing together and, and, bringing, and animating dignity and democracy. And we ask ourselves as we've been doing, as we always do, but as we've been doing, especially now during this week of confirmation hearings, what the role of the courts should be. Should the courts be talking about abortion, same-sex marriage, religion, Second Amendment rights, Fifth Amendment rights, or other things? I'd like to suggest, not instead of those other things, but that foundationally, the primary work of the Article III courts is to work in concert with Articles I and II, meaning to assure that Congress and the presidency are representative and reflective of the will of the people, to safeguard our democracy, to do what used to be called representation reinforcement. If the court would safeguard rights to participatory democracy, then it would be protecting human dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron, that was fantastic. Um, the, the points about representational democracy are a great, great segue to our next speaker, uh, Peggy Cooper Davis, who is the John S. R. Shad, Professor of Lawyering and Ethics and the Director of the Experiential Learning Lab at New York University School of Law. Peggy? Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's wonderful to follow Erin um, because her understanding of the concept of human dignity is so deep and wide. Um, mine is uh, less deep and narrower, but I hope that I can nonetheless make an interesting contribution to the conversation. Um, people don't talk about human dignity and constitutionalism without talking about South Africa. And um, my first experiences with the idea of human dignity um, came when I attended a conference uh, in South Africa honoring Lawrence Ackerman, who served as a justice of the South African Constitutional Court. And it was an amazing gathering because there were scholars there, there were ordinary citizens there, and there were several justices there engaged in lively conversation about human rights and about the idea of dignity. Um, and I have aspired since then to 
see that kind of conversation generated in this country. Um, and I've focused frequently on the profound thinking that went into honoring a commitment to human dignity in South Africa's constitution. It was clear to me in the justices writings that the key to this was that they saw themselves as a society that was in an ongoing process to come to terms with atrocity coming to terms that is with apartheid's denial of the dignity and humanity of black and brown people. This led me to the thought that the United States has perhaps not taken uh, on in the same way, coming to terms with the atrocity of slavery, not officially and not wholeheartedly and not without detouring into paths of obfuscation. This thought has only deepened in the decade or more since that conference. It came to me again a couple of years ago as I read Johar, the recent opinion of the high, highest court of India in validating laws that criminalized same-sex intimacy. And I noticed that the court positioned itself as post-colonial, that the court professed a conscious effort to follow lessons of empathy and respect that had been learned in a supremacist colonial context. Now, I don't say any of this to idolize or idealize the South African or the Indian government or courts, but it is to say that I see in their jurisprudence a reckoning with group-based atrocity. And I see that that reckoning nurtures the capacity for empathy and therefore facilitates a recognition and respect for human dignity and human rights. And I must confess that I see in United States jurisprudence a hesitancy to confront group-based cruelties and as a consequence, a hobbled capacity to recognize and respect human dignity and human rights. To put it differently, I believe that we in the United States would have a more humane set of constitutional principles were we to own and better understand our history of throwing off supremacist oppression and were we to complete the process. The realization that brings a people to throw off supremacist oppression is the realization that supremacist oppression is an affront to human dignity. Now, like South Africa and like India, as different as they are, the United States is post-colonial, although post-colonial in an atypical way. Of course, it is a product of rebellion against British imperial rule. But the United States rebellion was more a rebellion of colonizers than a rebellion of indigenous people, more like a Boer War than like an indigenous or enslaved people's liberation struggle. Many in the United States um, <clears throat> have trouble thinking of us as post-colonial, uh, alas, because the United States is too often thought of as an always already white country. And colonization is typically thought of in terms of white colonizers and black and brown colonized people. But the United States is post-colonial in a double sense 
not only because the revolution of 1775 was a war against distant monarchical rule, but also because the American Civil War was a war against a supremacist order and a war against the subordination of a group of people. Now, if you look at the history of the Reconstruction Amendments and the history of the Civil War, I believe you see that the germ of every recognition of human dignity and the germ of every recognition of human rights is in the liberation that the 14th Amendment in particular, but that the 13th through 15th Amendments in total brought to this country. And it was a liberation from a class-based society. And it was a commitment to universal citizenship, a commitment to universal human dignity, and a commitment to universal democracy. So, um, I argue that um, the way we understand what rights are fundamental is to think in two ways. To think about affronts to human dignity, in other words, as affronts that are intolerable to the victim or subject of the act that's being considered. And secondly, to think about affronts to human dignity as acts that are intolerable in the consensus judgment of observers. And that's what I meant earlier when I talked about reaction to atrocity. These are reactions to things that human beings will neither endure without coercion nor tolerate without approbation. This I know sounds like a smell test. I know it when I see it, but it's objective in two senses because it's a collective smell test that's verified not only by counter demonstration and reaction on the part of those subjected to injustice, but also by reasoned protest that extends beyond the target group. So the right seeking process of resistance, counter demonstration and protest plays out on a micro level whenever an infringement of human dignity is challenged on constitutional grounds. So I like to think of the United States Civil War as a war of liberation from colonial style oppression and to think of the post-Civil War reconstruction as the formation of a new multiracial nation that would stand, however half-heartedly at times, against supremacist oppression. To think this way is to adopt the perspectives of the great sociologist and historian W.E.B. Du Bois and the preeminent historian, contemporary historian of the United States Reconstruction, Eric Foner. It's to think of the process that I described before and the three indicia of atrocity 
to think of enslaved people deserting plantations and joining Union armies, to think of abolitionists who had not been enslaved also joining those armies, and to think of the United States as a people engaged since the beginning of the war in a struggle against supremacy and the cruelties that supremacy and lack of respect for human dignity engender. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy, that was wonderful. And also just a perfect segue into uh, the remarks of our next panelist, uh, Michael Tigar, uh, who is a renowned civil rights advocate that many of you know, and currently a professor emeritus of law at Duke University School of Law. Michael? There, now I'm unmuted. Uh, I, I want to follow along the wonderful thoughts that we've heard because we can see as we look around the world that this idea of dignity underpins all human rights and finds expression in national constitutions and laws and also in treaties and peremptory norms of international law. So I want to talk to the lawyers that are out there and ask this question. How is it that what we're talking about relates to the day-to-day -day concerns of the people on whose behalf you seek justice? And the first thing I want to make is the general remark that the enforcement of these dignity rights must, as a necessary condition, involve the creation of independent judicial bodies staffed by judges with the learning and the courage and the commitment to carry these rights into effect. Nan Aaron may have more to say about that with a more immediate concern. And I think of the time when I went back to South Africa after Nelson Mandela was released and I was asked to help the ANC people. They were going to have a new constitution that embodied these dignity rights. And yet we looked around and there were life tenured, life appointed judges, a hundred of them. And they were 99 of them were white and 99 of them were male. And the one non-white was uh, Ismail Muhammad, who was a, um, a, a Muslim a person. So there were no actual black judges in South Africa. Um, so you were gonna turn the enforcement of this new constitution over to them. Um, and as we thought about it, and we discussed back and forth with Dalla Omar, who's been Mandela's lawyer, this idea came out, let's have a constitutional court this constitutional court and President Mandela will appoint all its members. And the rest, as they say, is history. And I think it proves what we've been saying all week and that is it really does matter who you put on the Supreme Court. Um, after the Second World War, Churchill wanted to round up the Nazi leaders and shoot them. And Stalin agreed. Truman said, no, 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 let's have a tribunal. Let us establish abiding principles of war crimes and crimes against humanity. When France sought to confront the collaborationists in 1964, they amended the penal code and began this process of prosecutions for crimes against humanity. So that's number one. We must pay attention to the creation and maintenance of independent judicial institutions. Now point number two, I'm a lawyer, tried cases in 22 different states. And I wanna tell you, that I think that it is the lawyer's responsibility every day in every way for every client to project, embody, reflect, and demand dignity on behalf of that client in the crowded arraignment courts and urban communities, in the justice of the peace courts, as well as in the highest courts of this or that jurisdiction and the highest court in the land. And I give you some examples. 1953, down in Alabama, Mary Hamilton was a witness in a civil rights case in state courts, and she was an African-American. And as was the custom in Alabama in 1953, the cross-examiner addressed her as Mary. And she said, no, no, I am Miss Hamilton. I will be addressed in the same way that white witnesses are addressed. And I won't testify unless you do that. And the judge held her in contempt, sentenced her to five days in jail and a fine. She did the five days and then challenged the fine on appeal in the Supreme Court in Hamilton versus Alabama, 376 U.S. 650 per curiam said, that's right. That dignitary right is an essential part 
of the not only the appearance of the administration of justice, which it surely was, but also the administration of justice. In following on the Batson case into civil cases in Edmondson versus Leeville Concrete, 500 U.S. 614, Justice Kennedy had a brilliant um, thought, and that was that this isn't just about the rights of litigants to have a fair jury. He said, what could you say? to an African-American woman in Louisiana who comes down to court to perform a civic duty and is told by the judge, I'm sorry, you can't do that because you're black. That's what the denial, that's what prohibiting race-based peremptory challenges does. In the materials I've put in a wonderful example of Clarence Darrow's defense in the Ossian Sweet case to talk about how we lawyers, uh, can understand our obligation towards the defense of the rights of people of color in the brilliant way that Clarence Darrow did. And also an essay about Albert Camus and a wonderful new take on that book of his, The Stranger. Uh, are these old fashioned cases? I think not. Uh, in Lefsey, 867 F3rd 459, so that's not very long ago, is it? Uh, the Fourth Circuit had to reverse a district judge who had uh, maligned the country of origin and ethnicity of a criminal defendant on trial in his court and in the presence of the jury. And I tell you the terrible reproach to our profession about that case is that the lawyer, the court appointed lawyer for the defendant didn't object, but the Fourth Circuit saw its way to do this based on plain error. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then I see the 1994 case from North Carolina State versus Jenkins, 445 Southeast 2nd, 622, in which the trial judge turned his back on the testifying defendant. And when an objection was raised, said, yeah, that's what I did. You can do something about it. Well, yeah, they did something about it. The Court of Appeals reversed the conviction. Um, and the judge had the courage to stand up. Uh, and I'd like to close with that because, you know, we feel we kind of got to get along with the judges before whom we appear. And uh, we may be afraid to give offense, but we in this profession celebrate and justly so those lawyers who have stood up and denounced the visitation of indignities upon our clients, even when doing so uh, courted risks. There is that great tradition of Erskine, Thomas Erskine, later Lord Erskine, uh, and the judge said, sit, sir, I will not be interrupted. I stand here as an advocate of a brother citizen. Sit down, sir, remember your duty, or I shall be obliged to proceed in another manner. Your lordship may proceed in what manner you think fit. I know my duty as well as your lordship knows yours. I shall not alter my conduct. And to conclude, of course, because we always should, with the great Irish advocate, John Philpott Curran, who was attempting to uphold the dignity of his clients in colonial Ireland, and the English judge proclaimed, sit down, sir, or I shall be compelled to commit you for contempt. And Curran rocked back on his heels and said, well, then your lordship and I will both have the satisfaction of knowing it won't be the worst thing your lordship has ever committed. Um, so uh, dignity lives and it's our job to make it live. Thank you, Michael, that was wonderful. And so that I'm not held in contempt, let me introduce our next speaker. Uh, the Honorable Bernice Donald is a circuit judge <clears throat> pardon me, for the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. She's also the chair of the Dignity Rights Initiative for the American Bar Association Center for Human Rights, one of the sponsors of this program, and the immediate past chair of the American Bar so Association Center for Human Rights. Uh, and she's the driving force behind the American Bar Association's recent decision to recognize human dignity as foundational to the rule of law in America and beyond. Judge Donald. Thank you, Professor May. I wanna thank all of my esteemed colleagues um, who appear today for all of the incredible work that you do. I wanna offer a special debt of gratitude to Nan Aaron, and we can talk about that later, but what an important topic. I want to commend Mike Tigar for the strength of your commitment to these principles of dignity and for your admonition to lawyers about the need to stand up. 
um, keep in mind while the lawyers and the judges in this country are at different elevations in the courtroom, at the top of all of that stands justice. And our job is to see that justice is done in these proceedings. And there is also the record, because when you come to the appellate court, if it's not in the pleadings and it's not on the record, uh, it didn't happen. So keep Mike's words. I wanna go way back and talk uh, briefly about why this is so important and how I, I was influenced by it even before I knew about this area of the law. And I thank Professors Daly and May for enlightening the world and really bringing all of this into um, common documents that people can grab hold and, and look at. I'm gonna to refer to some things that uh, Professor Davis said without her eloquence and without uh, quoting them exactly, but it, it comes out of the same thing. Growing up in the great state of Mississippi, uh, our community was divided uh, along black and white. And the uh, materialistic status of those communities were evident even if you didn't see a single face. You knew when you were in one part of the community and when you were in another. A decade after Brown versus the Board of Education that said separate but equal is inherently unequal, Mississippi basically said, I disagree and continue to do what they had always done. And I think this gets to dignity because when we say equal, we all have in our mind uh, some modicum of what equality means. But as a student who was unborn when the case was filed and was three years old when the court decided the case, four years old when they, uh, when they uh, issued the remedies decision, and then six years old sometime thereafter, when I began school in 1957, in the aftermath of Brown, Professor Davis, black kids in North Mississippi still went to schools that did not have a modicum of dignity and had open res disrespect for the law. I went to a school that was a two room cinder block school with grades one and two in room one and grade three in room two. The upper grades went to school in the large one room black church where they pulled pews together and identified those pews as grades. So these three pews might be grade four, these three might be grade five and on and on and on and teachers were expected to teach in that environment. And when we talk about the dignity of people and the dignity of spaces, it was absent there, even though the teachers did their job under incredible conditions. The textbooks that the kids got down there all came down with names that were alien to us. We got the books that the white school had discarded. And if that weren't enough, there was no cafeteria, no separate room even where students could go and eat their lunch that their parents had prepared for them before they left home. There was no indoor plumbing in that school. There was no laboratory in the school or in the church. And in order that the kids might have water, the older African-American students filled large metal tin can pails and walk them from the well at the church back across the cemetery to the school so the young people could have water to drink. 1957 to 1959, 
because Mississippi said the conditions are separate but equal. And even though the Supreme Court has said what they've said, we, we're not ready to do that just yet. Eventually they did. But I wanna tell you what else was going on in 1959, just across the border in Tennessee. There were huge efforts being made to accord people the dignity of voting. Nobody, I won't say nobody, but, but, but white landowners, white planters, the white ruling class did not want African-Americans ever getting that franchise. And so most of the community of Fayette uh, County, Tennessee lived on farms. They lived on plantations. They shopped at stores that they did not own. And they lived in shanties that were owned by someone else. And they were basically pledged to the land to work. And outside agitators, if you will, came into those communities to begin a voter registration drive. And the people in the community said no. But when, when black folks insisted that they would go and vote, they had to stand in line until every white person who wanted to vote got a chance to go in and register. And then they were subjected to a literacy test. Now, uh, and, and, and you know, in many instances, whites and blacks were uh, subjected to literacy tests. So Professor Daly might be asked if she's in line to vote, how many jelly beans, uh, pardon me, what color are the jelly beans in this jar? Well, she can see them. So she can answer that question. But when it got to Professor Davis, is how many of each color jelly bean is in that jar. You can't go in there and count them. You just got to answer. And whatever your answer is, you're wrong. So you don't get to vote. They had to stand in line all day and they had a strip they could stand on. They could not step off that strip on the, on the grass. They could not sit down. Acts that intentionally, deliberately denied people dignity and respect in order to get to the ultimate deprivation of dignity. Eventually, when people insisted and they kept trying, they kept going back, the Justice Department came in because the business owners in Fayette County said to people, if you register, you can no longer live on my land. You may no longer shop at uh, these stores. You have to get off. And people had no place else to go. They could not get food. They could not buy anything, even if they had the money from the stores. And ultimately the Red Cross came in in Fayette County, Tennessee in 1959 and 60 and set up a whole city of tents so that people could be sheltered from the rains and the storms. Eventually the Justice Department brought suit. So if you wanna look at this, look up Tent City in Fayette County, Tennessee. There were many babies born on dirt floors in tents, born out of the insistence that the ruling class would not accord the basic fundamental legal right and dignity that went along with getting the franchise. And that's why I said, Peggy, it relates many, many years later to what you were talking about, but you said that these things continue. And the final thing that I will say, the thing that led me in the first instance to become a judge was standing in court, Mike, waiting to represent my client and seeing a judge utterly deny a defendant charged with a misdemeanor offense basic and fundamental dignity and respect. And even though it wasn't my client, I decided that I can do better than that and we must be better than that. And so on that notion, I decided that I would put myself out there and become a judge and so the rest is history. But um, those are the things that I wanna say right now and I hope I'll have an opportunity to say more later. 
Thank you, Judge Donald. I uh, never tire of hearing the story about uh, the important role that Dignity played in the arc of your career and your contributions to this field. Thank you for those wonderful remarks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nan Aaron, who is the president and longtime driving force behind Alliance for Justice. Alliance for Justice is a national association representing a broad array of groups committed to progressive values and the creation of an equitable, just, and free society. And since 1979, the Alliance has been a leader in advocating for a fair and independent justice system, uh, preserving access to the courts, many of, in the ways that uh, Judge Donald just remarked upon, and empowering others to stand up and fight for the dignity of their causes. And the Alliance is led by our next speaker, Nan Aaron. Nan, thank you. Thank you, Jim. And what a treat to be among these amazing speakers. And thank goodness Bernice Donald put, allowed herself and put herself forward for a federal judgeship. Um, the, the country owes you a, a big debt of gratitude for doing that. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about judicial nominations because I think as M Michael Tiger noted and others, uh, judges in our society, and I know that it's known to our audience, hold just such powerful and awesome um, uh, privileges and have such power over the lives of, of all of us and certainly our individuals we look to um, as people who will recognize and respect dignity. Um, judges decide every aspect of our lives from the water we drink to the air we breathe to the protections we have in the workplace, almost every aspect of American life. And the way individuals and Americans are treated is due to a federal court and a federal judge. And if, you, if any of us needed proof as to the power of federal judges, when we look at the current nomination of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court, I think we can all agree this is probably Donald Trump's most consequential act uh, of his uh, nearly five year term uh, in office. He will have appointed He's already appointed two Supreme Court justices and if confirmed, uh, Barrett will become his third. And we also know that while Donald Trump will be in office four years, maybe eight years, Supreme Court justices as well as lower court justices have life tenure. So they'll, Trump's judges will be making decisions long after he leaves office. In fact, I was thinking the Clarence Thomas, for instance, has been on the Supreme Court during five different presidencies. So that's just how powerful these nine individuals uh, are in, in, our, in our country. Now, when we think of what makes for a good judge, we can look at the American Bar Association's criteria. Um, we want judges who have very strong analytic abilities. We want judges who are individuals of impeccable honesty. And we want judges who have um, something referred to as by the ABA as judicial temperament. And these are typically the kinds of standards that we think um, make for a good federal judge and probably state court judge as well. But I wanted to say a few words about something else. And that is going forward, um, in addition to those three criteria, I think particularly now in our society, given the complicated nature of problems we're encountering and we will face in the future, that we have to call upon our Senate and White House. Uh, after all, the president gets a chance to suggest who he or she, or he in this case, would like to 
the uh, federal court, but it's really up to the Senate to decide one way or the other whether that person will be confirmed. And I would certainly suggest going forward that the next president, um, particularly if there is a change in the White House, consider not only demographic diversity, but professional or experiential diversity. I am proud to say that Presidents Clinton and President Obama placed uh, demographic diversity as a priority, and thank goodness for that. Um, during their tenure as presidents, we were very grateful and to have a whole uh, group of judges, diverse judges, um, who really could bring their experiences and backgrounds to the art and practice of judging. But I wanna say something else, and that is, I am hoping that the next administration not only takes into account the critical importance of demographic diversity, but professional diversity. And by that, I mean, uh, considers the appointment, recruiting, identifying, not just corporate lawyers and prosecutors uh, who um, are a peer um, and are, have seats on most of our federal courts of appeal today, but consider lawyers such as public defenders, public interest lawyers, civil rights lawyers, plaintiffs lawyers, lawyers who will bring a very rich experience and background uh, to their judging. And of course, why is this so important? Um, when judges make decisions as to whether a witness is credible, whether a claim is plausible, um, when police officers systematically stop and frisk racial minorities, we want to know that there are judges sitting in those cases who are influenced by the nature of their work, their backgrounds, and have some experience understanding how the law affects everyday human beings. It's important for judges to come from all corners of the legal profession and that they are equipped to understand the views of very different litigants um, because this will allow them to render, I believe, more informed decisions. Um, having judges come from a diversity of professional and experiential backgrounds, therefore, not only enhances the decision-making process, but I believe uh, is essential to maintaining public trust or public confidence in our justice system. Um, when an individual suffers an injustice, um, she's paid less because of her gender, uh, a plant, an industrial plant, pollutes uh, drinking water in a community. Um, it's important for those sitting in judgment um, to need to understand from based on their own experiences and be able to listen with an open mind um, to the case at hand. Every litigant going into a federal court needs to understand that they have a fair shake, that when they go into the court, that courtroom, the deck is not stacked against them. And too often these days when litigants go into courtrooms, whether it's federal district court, whether it's some of our courts of appeal, all they have to do sometimes is see who the three judges are on their panel or who the district court judge is. And they know before they have even stepped into that courtroom, particularly if they're a person who's at the margins, who's poor, an immigrant, a woman denied fair pay, pay, uh, they know, based on who those judges are, whether or not they're going to get a, a fair shake in that courtroom. 
So I think all of this comes down to judicial nominations. It comes down to who's president. It comes down to who's in the Senate. Uh, these, uh, the two parties have very different views uh, as to criteria for what makes a good judge. But I am hoping moving forward that uh, our president and our Senate consider a range of experiences um, and uh, also backgrounds in appointing federal judges. And I'll just conclude with, with two points. One is Peggy mentioned uh, empathy. And I remember when Sonia Sotomayor was having her hearing uh, before the Senate and uh, President Obama had referred to Sonia Sotomayor as a person of great empathy. And of course she had, she had worked at Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund. She had been a district court judge. Um, she really grew up in a community and gave expression to that community in her work on the district court and court of, um, and court of appeals. Um, I remember senators making fun of the fact that she had been portrayed as a judge with empathy. And I remember thinking, and I remember hearing the president say, well, what an important characteristic for a judge and a justice. And I hope we can get back to, to that time. And finally, I have a book on my bookshelf, which I've kept for many years, a book called Unlikely Heroes by Jack Bass. It's an old book, but it's one of my favorites because it takes us back to a time to the great old Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. That's Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, when judges were appointed, and these were Republican judges by and large, and pretty conservative judges on that old Fifth Circuit. In fact, one, and I'm not proud to say this, had been a member of a discriminatory club. But even then, uh, these men, and they were men, uh, were open-minded, fair-minded enough so that when great civil rights litigation was brought and argued before them, these judges listened. They didn't just hear, but they listened and they made decisions that helped our country uh, move forward um, and do wonderful things in, in civil rights. So thanks again, and uh, I look forward to uh, people's questions and comments. Thank you, Nan. And thank all the, I wanna thank all the panelists for a wonderful whirlwind discussion and perspectives on the importance of dignity in our national experiment of this representational democracy. We heard from the president of the ABA, Patricia Lee Rafo, about the importance of dignity, reflecting the ABA resolution about dignity as foundational to the just rule of law. Next, we heard from Aaron Daly and Peggy Cooper Davis, who provided insight into the importance of recognizing human dignity in the service of democracy. And then Michael Tigar about protecting dignity of litigants in court, citing not only case names, but also numbers. And Judge Donald in maintaining the dignity of the courtroom and in protecting the voting franchise. And then last with Nan Aaron on the impacts of the impact of dignity uh, in judicial appointments and unlikely heroes along the way in protecting the dignity of everyday Americans, as she put it. So now it's time for conversation and questions. So let me just begin by pivoting back to the panel for reflections uh, around, uh, any reflections about what we've just heard from the other panelists. So we'll just go through the panel again, Siri Adam, uh, beginning with Aaron Daly. Aaron. Thank you. Um, gosh, I hope everybody learned as much as I did from these, from these talks. Um, there's obviously a lot to a lot more to talk about. I think obviously we've just barely scratched the surface of the issues relating to dignity and democracy in our own sort of constitutional system. I guess I'll just make a couple of quick comments. One picking up on the sort of one of the last things that Nan talked about about empathy as a as a trait as a judicial 
uh, as part of the judicial temperament, what we might like to see. And I do think that empathy is so deeply connected to respect for dignity, right? That no matter what your background is, no matter what your personal experiences are, no matter what you've experienced in your life, and none of us has the same, right? Everybody just comes to it from a different perspective, from a different, um, you know, brings to different experiences. And yet the point of, of dignity is to remember that we are all the same, that dignity is what unites us when everything else divides us, different races, different colors, different experiences, different classes, different, you know, some lawyers, some not, whatever it is. But dignity is what unites us. It what's unite, it's what unites all of humanity to each other. So we shouldn't have such a difficult time looking at somebody who's different from us and respecting them as an equal because they are an equal. They're equal in dignity and importantly for the purposes of this conversation, equal in dignity and equal in rights. And I think when we go back to South Africa to the incredibly articulate exposition of these ideas in, in many of Justice Sachs' and Justice Ackerman's opinions. What, what, um, what they're talking about is that interconnectedness, that ability to see across differences and to see that we all really want the same thing. We all want to be able to live a life with dignity. We all want to live in community with others and to ensure that others in that community can also live a life with dignity. The, one other point that I just want to make quickly um, is about our constitution. Um, it is, I won't go too far out on a limb here to say an imperfect document, but what's perfect about it is that it contains within it the ability to improve, the ability to fix itself, the ability to bring us ever closer to a, a, a constitution of dignity. And I know that most of the most recent, well, most of the amendments to the constitution, particularly after the first 10, were dignity enhancing amendments, right? Amendments beginning as Peggy Cooper Davis reminded us, but amendments beginning with the civil war amendments providing for equal protection. And then for the, the prohibition against discrimination on the basis of race, specifically in voting, because nothing is more important, right? And then the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote, because again, expanding the franchise, expanding the polity, expanding who has a voice that matters within this community is so important. The 23rd Amendment actually giving uh, DC electoral college votes. The 24th Amendment eliminating the poll tax. We heard about some of the effects of a poll tax and in, its, in, in all of its various formations, some of which we're still seeing today. Um, and of course the 26th amendment extending the right to vote to people who were young enough to be called into military service that they should have the, road to, the right to vote also. So I, I think it's valuable to see our constitution as a document that has the capacity to continually bring us closer to um, to the convergence of dignity and democracy and to a polity that respects both at its, at its core. So thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Michael, your thoughts, please. Oh. I'm sorry, Peggy, Peggy Cooper Davis. Oh, I, I think Peggy is first. Thank you. It doesn't matter. I can go in either order. Um, but I, I must say, I can't resist echoing things that Aaron has already said. Um, first, on the subject of empathy. Uh, I've been struck as I've looked at the opinions um, of the Constitutional Court of South Africa and the highest court of India, that they quite explicitly say <clears throat> that in order to decide whether an infringement of a person's liberty should be tolerated by the constitution. It is necessary to be able to imagine oneself in the position of that person whose rights have been infringed. And so an explicit and conscious attention to the need to respect human dignity becomes a mandate to cultivate empathy. And so I join Aaron in 
um, thanking Nan for putting this idea of empathy on the table. I, I also want to say that, <clears throat> and, and this follows to some extent on what Aaron has said about the um, capacity of our constitution to grow. Um, I think that's right. And, and I really appreciate her cataloging the amendments that have extended the right to access to democracy. But I wanna add that the reconstruction amendments all by themselves can be understood and I believe should be understood as revolutionary. After all, there is a grant of universal citizenship and there is no reason to interpret citizenship without an idea of dignity, of universal dignity. There we have a grant to everyone of the privileges and immunities of citizenship. And there in the 13th amendment, we have a grant of civil freedom. So the shift from being a constitution that allowed certain people to be non-persons, non-citizens, indeed to be property, to a constitution that created universal citizenship with privileges and immunities and a right to freedom is a huge thing. And that's what I want to emphasize when I talk about the power of the Reconstruction Amendments. Thank you. Michael, your thoughts, please. I, I'm struck by what Nat Aaron said about the need for judges who understand people who've had real life experiences. I think of Judge Mates presiding over the Terry Nichols trial and allowing the defense to present fully the image of the issues that had to be decided. I think of Sam Sparks, a judge in Austin. Now, both of them appointed by Republican presidents, by the way, but with real trial lawyer experience. But let's take that home to you, the lawyer that's sitting there. That's our job in the first instance, to begin to understand the plight of this human being whose life, liberty, property is in our hands, whose life is very, very different from ours, very, very different perhaps from the lives of the jurors who will decide his or her fate. And I can remember trying to bring that home to the jury in the Nichols case by saying after all the victims had testified and shouted and screamed and there we are. I said to the jurors, you know, I feel like I'm trying to, to, to confronted by a wave of grief and vengeance. And I wonder if you feel that way. So the real question members of the jury is, how we can get to higher ground with centuries of our civilization piled so high. How can we all escape from this trap of grief, using grief and vengeance as a basis to decide? And I want to point out, we fool ourselves, we lawyers. I thought while Peggy was talking about the University of Texas, Sweat versus Painter, Heyman Sweat applies an African-American to law school at the University of Texas. He gets in, then he discovers he's black, so they say, oh no, and they, he sues. And Texas sets up a separate but equal uh, law school, uh, which doesn't have a law review, doesn't have a library, doesn't have premises, doesn't have a faculty. And Charles McCormick, yes, that's McCormick on evidence, the dean, testifies under oath that it was in every material respect the equal of the law school over which he was the dean. And the Supreme Court thought that didn't pass the straight face test. But the problem was that here is this distinguished lawyer who simply uh, didn't get the point. And I want to conclude, I hope not, uh, with this notion of what Aaron said. This originalism stuff, that's going to make you sick because the people that wrote this constitution did not think it was a set of fetters they were forging. They thought it was a constitution they were building. In the Anglo-American tradition of judicial interpretation, we understand that 
the text of old documents can give us ideas, but that the job of judges is to apply the living law. Um, I've written about that. Lord Justice Sedley has recently written a book called Lions Under the Throne, which I commend to you. And um, all I can say is that uh, we, we need to expose this nonsense and uh, go forward and do our job. Thank you, Michael. That also seems to echo Chief Justice John Marshall's remarks in McCulloch versus Maryland that we must never forget that it is a constitution that we're expounding. Judge Donald, your thoughts. She might be. I think perhaps she was called away. Okay, so Nan, any additional thoughts from you about what we've heard from the panel? Thank you. So I've been thinking of this week um, when we've had four days of a hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee um, over the confirmation of, of Amy Coney Barrett. And it, it always strikes me about how much public attention these hearings get because most people, unfortunately, don't think about court of appeals judges, district court judges. Um, but when there is a nomination to the Supreme Court, the public takes interest and in there are televised hearings before the committee. And I always have a feeling after these hearings are over, what did the public learn about the Constitution? What did the public learn about advice and consent? And I, I uh, always regret the hearings, particularly the past few recent hearings, um, are just mindless. Uh, Michael mentioned uh, you've got one crowd on the Senate Judiciary Committee who speaks up about textualism and originalism. And we all know that it's a game, that it, these are neutral sounding words that these senators probably don't even understand themselves. Um, but they are a pretext um, for an ideology. And that's really what's at play. Uh, on the other side, you've got a group of senators who are talking about the First Amendment, the Ninth Amendment, um, the Fourth Amendment, um, how the law intersects with everyday lives and how the judicial nominees' views will impact um, individuals in a variety of different ways. I am hoping that we can look forward to a time when our hearings really can focus on the Constitution, the promise that the Constitution holds out for, for all of us, um, how critical it is in preserving our liberties and our freedoms and our rights. Um, we're not there yet, but I do think there will be a time when a hearing over a Supreme Court judicial nominee can really bring forth a national conversation in a real way um, as to uh, what our constitution means in the year 2020 and 2021 and um, the expectations it holds for, for all of us. So thank you, Nan, uh, that was fantastic. And Judge Donald has been called into chambers in case you're wondering what happened, she may be back. Uh, but let's turn to just uh, the questions from uh, the folks who are listening in. And I'll just read you this first one, it's short, and I'll ask for any, any insight, any thoughts. Um, and we don't have to do it seriatim, it's just uh, sort of the Thanksgiving uh, table, just speak up. Uh, could you, here's the question, could you help us better understand how the respect for dignity rights is reframing the scope of state responsibilities? Any thoughts about that? Thank you. Um, Does the question mean the, the, the states of the United States or? <laughs> I think that's the intent of the question, Michael. I'm not sure, but I think that's the intent, yes. Well, I'll only briefly note that Justice Brennan's uh, Madison lectures 
the second of them was given at NYU uh, at a time when he was beginning to lose his uh, majority that he directed on the court. And he pointed us towards the importance of state constitutions and provided you can escape the Michigan versus Long uh, trap that Justice O'Connor, I think, put out there. Uh, we've got to focus on what state constitutions can do. And there's a number of impressive examples of that. Um, I, want, I want to agree with that, but I want to add something. Um, the, this whole idea of states' obligations versus federal obligations to define and enforce human rights is right at the heart of what I talk about when I talk about the revolutionary character of the Reconstruction Amendments. Because efforts to expand civil and human rights under the 13th, 14th, and to some extent the 15th Amendment have been met with what I have written about and called the Confederate narrative. And that is a narrative that says the United States was from its founding committed to state autonomy and independence. And it could not be, it simply could not be that <coughs> the drafters, pardon me, of the Reconstruction Amendments intended to compromise that principle at all. Now, we are living in times in which we see that sometimes state government takes a position that's more respectful of human rights than does the federal government. And that's something we ought to keep in mind and think about in a somber way. But there is something wrong, I think, with a line of argument, this Confederate narrative, that leaves us in the position of having to say when we enter international treaties, for example, that the federal government does not have full authority to enforce them. And so I believe that since the Reconstruction Amendments, the federal government should have ultimate authority to articulate and to protect human rights, understanding um, in these times when, you know, there are um, sanctuary cities and thinking back to the times when there was a Fugitive Slave Act, <laughs> that certainly sometimes the smaller units of government will get it right. But I think in the end, we have to be committed to a national floor of respect for human dignity and human rights. Um, if I can just add to that a couple of thoughts, and I think we're all sort of very much in agreement and sort of trying to draw this picture in, in different ways, but it's fundamentally the same, the same picture. Um, in terms of, of the components within the United States, it is worth noting that Montana and Puerto Rico in their constitutions both protect explicitly human dignity. And Puerto Rico in particular has an extremely rich jurisprudence of dignity, wherein its courts have said that dignity is, is very much the foundation of its legal system. And there are actually a number of cases about the obligations of lawyers and of judges to, um, to act with dignity as a component of their, professional res of, of their obligations uh, for professional responsibility in addition to other kinds of, of issues that the dignity right reaches in Puerto Rico. So it is a really interesting model of, of an American jurisprudence of dignity and what that could look like if it was sort of brought into full flower. Um, I'll give sort of um, 
one one example um, sort of from a technical legal standpoint a little bit, um, although case names have already been mentioned, so I won't be I won't get that technical. But one way we think about we see dignity instantiated or, or ref, reframing the scope of state responsibility um, a little bit in Puerto Rico and in Montana, but much more so in other countries of the world is by recognizing that states have not only negative obligations to refrain from violating constitutional rights, but also positive obligations to ensure that everybody can, can live with dignity and has access to, to certain things that will enable them to live with dignity. So in the jurisprudence around the world, we see sort of this melding of negative and positive rights, recognizing that it doesn't really matter from the state perspective, from, from the individual's perspective, whether your dignity has been violated by something that the state has failed to do or by something that the state is actively doing. In either case, the state has an obligation to ensure that you can live with dignity and to protect you from it. And I think that, and in conjunction with the comments of Michael and Peggy and Nan previously also, what we see here is that unlike in the way um, the confirmation hearings are sometimes portrayed, and I'm reminded also of Justice, now Justice Roberts's commitment to being an umpire, right, in his constitutional interpretation, which came out in his confirmation hearings, and this notion that judges are neutral, um, whatever that means. But what we see in um, jurisprudence that is committed to dignity is that in fact judges are not neutral. That's not to say they're biased or political, but it is to say that they are committed to this fundamental value of dignity. And that's not neutral. Um, it, 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 it does have content, as we say, and, and that, um, that is one way of judging that we, might, that we might ask of our judges. Thank you, Erin. So we have a whole line of questions, and if I could uh, just ask uh, remarks from here on to be as brief as possible so that we can reach as many of these as possible. But the next goes to the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, which was joined by liberal and conservative justices. Um, and the question really goes to whether in the extent to which it reflects the need for litigants to be, uh, to be treated with dignity and whether you agree that's what happened in that case. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's such a wonderfully hard question. I like wonderfully hard questions. Um, of course, it, it didn't decide much because it, um, in the end, was based on the justices being persuaded that there had been some insult or affront to the religious views of the cake shop owner. Um, and so the court never got to the very hard question of balancing the rights of LGBTQ people to dignity as they move in the society and the rights of religious groups to oppose their lifestyle. And, you know, this is perhaps the hardest question, one of the very hardest questions that we face now. And I, I'm sorry if I go on too long, but it's, it's, a, it's a big and important question. Um, whether respect for religious freedom allows us to engage in acts that are or certainly seem disrespectful to certain groups in our society. And it's clear that that is going to be the hardest and biggest question that the Supreme Court will face going forward. Um, it now has a case in which it's looking to see whether a foster care agency can refuse to consider same-sex foster parents. Um, 
And it's, it's the same issue, this tension between respect for religious freedom and offering the opportunity for every citizen, indeed every human being, to move in the society with dignity. And, um, you know, uh, panels of this kind are the places in which we can explore that question deeply and understand the dignitary affront on each side and decide how open we want to be and how tolerant we need to be as a society. I just want to add one sentence and that to what Peggy has said, and that is I worry that our courts are weaponizing religious freedom and that that will come at the expense of diminishing the rights of LGBTQ individuals. I worry about the future of Obergefell. I really worry about it after this week and hearing the testimony. Um, uh, before the Senate Judiciary Committee. I think we have to be um, very aware of, of certain strains and trends and, um, and make sure that the individual's worth of the LGBTQ community remains a, a paramount. And, and there's even, victimized. yeah, there's even more reason than to worry. Um, given the statements of Justices Thomas and Alito and yes. the recent cert denial. It's yes. terrifying. Well, let me thank you um, for those remarks as well. We've heard from mm -hmm. Professors Daly and Cooper Davis and from Nan Aaron. Um, Judge Donald isn't with us for any final remarks. So Michael, we're just down to a couple of minutes. So if you have 30 seconds or so for final remarks, I would welcome that before we conclude the program. Thank you. 30, all right, 30 seconds. With respect to uh, parents, read Judge Daughtry's dissent in DeBoer versus Snyder uh, in the Sixth Circuit, which became then, which was then reversed in Obergefell. The point here is that, that we need to respect the religious views of everybody. Uh, however, if I accept a job to perform a public function, I may be expected they may be expected because these are the rules under which we all live to perform that public function in a way that respects dignity in a way that's been defined and reasonably so by the state. Um, and I don't want to oversimplify this, but a federal district judge that I know said, you know, I really don't believe in the death penalty, but if I have to, if I wind up trying a capital case, well, that is the oath I took. And if I didn't want the job, and I didn't want to do the job, then I shouldn't take the job. And I don't think that's oversimplifying under these circumstances. But I think it's a debate that has to be approached quite respectfully in order to draw these, uh, to draw these lines. And I conclude anyway by saying, um, this has been wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, and let me just say in closing and on behalf of co-sponsors, the ABA section, of Civil Rights and Social Justice and the Center for Human Rights and the Dignity Rights Project. Uh, let me thank our panelists, Professors Daly, Cooper Davis, and Tigar, Judge Donald, and the Alliance for Justice's Nan Aaron for making time within their extremely busy schedules to join us. We'd also like to express our gratitude to you for joining us today. Um, the section of civil rights and social justice provides free web, web, pardon me, <laughs> webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. And we hope that this helps your work. And if you can, please consider joining and becoming an active member in the ABA. You may do so at the ABA website associated with this program. And you can also find information on other free programs on this webpage. Lastly, let me thank Ali Kielsbark for facilitating this conversation. Michael Pates for his leadership in operationalizing dignity under law within the American Bar Association Center for Human Rights. Aaron Daly again for suggesting this program and Judge Donald for providing vision about how to actualize human dignity under law within the American Bar Association. And again, last but not least, of course, you for joining us. This concludes our program. 
We hope you have a safe and dignified weekend. So long.